Hi everyone, Steve Perriman again on the Steve Perriman podcast. Um, still question time for Steve. Um, I, uh, Tom, as ever, we're still uh, leaving Howard on loan somewhere uh, to have a rest. Um, probably got one more question uh, podcast after this to mop up the rest of the questions, depending on how many we get through today. And then we'll have another short break of a couple of weeks and then we'll go into uh, the sort of next season and maybe the rumours and signings and all that stuff, which everyone does. So not everyone else doing podcasts has got my sort of insight into past events. So let's do what we're good at, hopefully. And um, so, Tom, I think you're going to show us the first question from Howard and Vivian uh, involving my decision to go to Japan. So let's hear it. Stevie, you are well known to be something of a home bird, having spent most of your playing career at Spurs. And even knowing of the horrors you experienced with sugar, it still came as a surprise to me to discover that you were going to manage a team in Japan. That's a big decision. Not knowing the language, taking kids out of school, and going completely to a completely different culture and environment. How did you go about it, and how did you feel? So, good question, Howard um, and Vivian. I expect Vivian had a, an input into that question. Um, I was so turned off by the Spurs experience when Ozzy went back and then encouraged me to join him. Um, the club was being led by Mr Sugar. Um, I was so disenchanted with football in general, but Tottenham, how it was going, my club was not the same club as the one I was brought up with. Um, the manager did not rule anymore. It was more about egos and saving money and cutting, etc. Uh, and I'm not saying that we didn't sign players. Of course we did. But uh, general atmosphere around the place, I, I thought it was fairly toxic. That was my opinion anyway. Whether it was anyone else's, I don't know. But um, all sorts of trouble um, created by poor management from upstairs, in my opinion. So um, I was completely switched off to it. This was not the game that I knew and loved. It was not certainly not the club that I knew and loved. So um, eventually we get shown the door. No problem with that. Everyone thought I was devastated by it, but trust me, I wasn't. I was jumping for joy uh, to get away from that, uh, that group of people. So um, Ozzy went to Mexico. I went to Norway. Um, Ozzy was inviting myself and Kim to Mexico for Christmas because the Norwegian season, obviously weather reasons, was shut down. And it became apparent to me that Ozzy didn't think he was going to last there, although he was top of the league. So that happened. Ozzy did come back before Christmas. And then I suppose he felt obliged with Sylvia, his wife, to invite myself and Kim and the young child, uh, I think Ella was about four or five months old, um, to spend Christmas and New Year with him, which was a great, um, lovely respect from Ozzy and his wife. And then while I was there, the phone went, and actually it was a friend of mine, Alf Darcy, a FIFA agent, uh, was asking Ozzy if he wanted to go to Japan. And Ozzy put his hand over the phone, looked at me and said, do we want to go to Japan, Steve? And I said, too, right, we do. So Ozzy had been with Spurs to Japan once. I'd been twice uh, in previous years, in my very early days. And then the days after Ozzy and Ricky joined us when the whole world wanted to play Tottenham Hotspur. So we went and played in the Japan Cup and won it. And I always, I always felt it was a fantastic country. And the respect that was lacking towards us from... Tottenham Hotspur, 1993 or whatever it was, four, 
um, was in abundance in Japan. And that's how they deal with people. They get you over as a big name, Aussie World Cup winner, who decided to take me with him. They checked me out and my record of, at Spurs and decided that, that that was a good record and good CV. So, um, of course, life is going to be difficult. Of course, it's going to be hard from the start. You're taking a six-month-old child there. And you're going to live in strange accommodation and you're going to visit food shops and not understand anything that's going on. So do you know what? I felt such a surge of energy by being out of England, out of the clutches of certain people and, and regimes in England. And we were listened to we were respected and the players just sucked the knowledge out of us. And um, so respectful, so respectful. And they, before that season started, when we joined, they have a manager's meeting and obviously Ozzy was the manager. So he got invited again, respectfully, they invited me because they knew, they knew of my appearance record etc my service to Tottenham Hotspur that was got a great name in Japan so I was invited to that same meeting and it carried on from there and because we did a very very good job that level of respect just continued on and on and on and therefore I stayed for five years Aussie only for three because he decided to get back uh, into European football by by joining um, I think Croatia team and um so yeah and then i i returned after coming home the first time i returned for about another 18 months so in all i had about seven years there but life became easier every month you understood the language a bit more particularly my wife kim she learned japanese two children so we had a second daughter while we were there they learned japanese and um the local people were amazing and wonderful they treated us with such i keep using the same word respect and um that is how you get the best out of your the football brains that you're bringing over from england of course that would be expensive it's not easy to house two families and service the wages and pay the bonuses because we kept winning and um but in the end, they knew that we were worth every penny and um, they let us know it. The players adored Ozzy. I mean, adored him and his style and his flair of management and his desire for technique and um, uh, what's the word? He, their reactions, he worked on their reactions. So all in all, um, yes, miss my family. My father died while I was in Japan, actually in Korea, uh, winning an Asian Cup game that we eventually won that that uh, tournament. But um, so you miss a lot out of what's happening at home. Um, miss my brothers, miss my family. Um, but uh, overall, it was fantastic to give me my faith back in football. I'd fell out of love with both football and Tottenham Hotspur and I regained it particularly for football um, thousands of miles away and I think we between us me and Aussie we spread the good name of English football Argentinian football and Tottenham as a name and um, so no bad thing great decision to go and one I'm truly truly grateful for and um, yeah, so good question. Very good question. Okay, Tom, so we'll now go on to Tony Galvin, who in his own style gives us his question. So go on, Tony, hit us with your question, please. Hello, Steve, Tony Galvin here. My question is, in what way did Bill Nicholson and Keith Birkinshaw as managers influence you as a player either positively or negatively 
And could you give us a few examples, please? All the best. Cheers. So, uh, thank you, Tony. I suppose that, um, in a way, Tony's asking about um, the different styles of Bill Nicholson and Keith uh, with regard to their management. Um, I think it has to be said that I was a young player learning his trade under Bill Nicholson and his staff, and I could not have had better teachers. I could not have had. They, it was tough love that I've spoken about before. There was not too much praise around. And I learned to be a battle-hardened professional footballer that knew what how, how honoured you should be to play for Tottenham Hotspur to wear that white shirt. And, um, yeah, I think Bill being a very, very good manager, used me for his own purposes, which didn't necessarily suit my game. He, he, made, he turned me from an inside forward to a defensive midfield player. And that was what the team needed. And that was therefore why I was going to be selectable. So I wasn't arguing with that. Um, so that is at the coal face where the manager can't have too much heart about things. He had a lot of heart, Bill Nick. But he had to be result driven at times. And that result driven bit was was turning me into a defensive midfielder. And um, but as a young player, it gave me an education. It gave me a vision of the game uh, and a purpose. Bill Nicholson introduced me to to uh, captaincy, made me vice captain, um, which eventually led to me being captain. So that was a hell of a hell of a decision he made there for a young player which I again I'm grateful for and I I think I met the right people at the right time during my career and my brother Ted was one Phil Holder when I was an apprentice was another Bill Nicholson in those early professional years making me aware of what it takes to get a result and become consistent and one negative because there's always negatives um, I used to be a little bit fearful of Bill and Bill and Eddie used to do these uh, particular sort of training exercises where you would, you know, one second you would be going down the left and crossing with your left and then you would change over and go down the right and cross with your right or finish on your left and then next time you finish on your right. And I was a particularly one-footed player and I think the way that Bill Nicholson reacted when you practice in your left foot went wrong, which it's going to do on your weak foot at times, and you, you're made to look a bit foolish. I think his reaction could have been a bit better. And at times I would cross from the right and then make out I was going to the left, but end up going back on the right again, <laughs> just just to avoid his stare of uh, crossing the ball wrongly with my with my poor foot. So I don't think that particularly helped my development. But I always say that if you if you've got a weaker foot, but you get extra good on your right foot, and I'm not saying my right foot was like Glenn's or Ozzy's or anyone like that, but I had a good touch and I could find the the target. So um, I think that um, by being a bit fearful of Bill Nick, educated me, gave me a long career because the, the, the teaching at that young age stays with you forever. So, um, and the, of course, leading me into captaincy was great. So Keith, I met at a later stage in my career. He, um, was a young manager. I suppose I was a young captain. I think we learned a lot together. We, we bounced off each other ideas. And I normally say that because I played 42 out of 42 games in the relegation season, it must have had something to do with me. I think if, the, if I did have a fault, it was a, maybe a naivety in my captaincy. Keith had a naivety in his... his um, management possibly um but you know how you learn you learn by failing and children falling over learn eventually how to walk 
So um, it wasn't Keith giving me an education like Bill Nick had done, but I was through the education and you never know everything, but um, he allowed me to express my captaincy and my opinions. And um, that ended up being probably my main asset uh, as a footballer. Yes, I could pass. Yes, I could do this. I could tackle. I could challenge. I could cover ground. But I think the leadership aspect and the, the, the bit I could give to young players around me, and I am particularly proud of the 84 UEFA Cup final when I didn't even take part in the second game. But I knew a lot of players on that pitch, homegrown, had an influence from me during their rise to the first team. So, um, so I think Keith opened the doors to that for me. Okay, Bill, Bill gave me the leg up into captaincy, but Keith actually helped it flower. Um, and I was prepared to say anything, do anything. Um, whereas with Bill Nicholson, I would have been so respectful. I listened to his every command. I tried to carry it out to the letter. And in some ways, that sort of stifled my inside forwardness of being a, a, an all-round footballer. Um, but as I say, the, the positive things of that is it gave me a, a long career and a longevity in, um, in the game, which uh, really stood me in good stead. So, so, yeah, I can't really say a negative about Keith other than, than you know, he, he, I said to him once in, in, we used to always finish off with a 9v9 across half a pitch. And I pointed out to him one day that, and it wasn't particularly about me, but I said, Keith, you, you never praise good defending. You never praise a player when he holds a player up and makes him go sideways or backwards or blocks a shot. You never praise that, but you're praising all the time the special skill. And um, therefore, and th th my point about that was, if you want us to be a better defensive team, harder to beat, then um, I think you've got to... You've got to praise the defensive aspects to us a bit more than you do. But uh, that wasn't particularly to me because I had enough confidence about I, how I defended. Um, but particularly for younger players, they need to be told they're doing the right thing, even in a 9v9 across half a pitch when there's no one watching. So, um, so yeah, that's my answer. So... Let's go on to Adam, Adam Powley. Adam Powley helped me write um, the book, uh, my last book. And um, I get on particularly well with Adam and I'm sure that he's got a good question uh, for us to listen to. Go, Adam. Hi, Steve. Uh, just a quick note to say thank you very much for all the fantastic podcasts you've done over the course of this season, really good, really informed and real insight into, into the game and uh, your expertise and your experience that you share with your listeners. So always a really good listen. Uh, so I've got a question for you. We often hear the term mentality used to describe what teams need to be successful and particularly like to win trophies. So it's the mentality word that is like, you know, really important. And it's also often said about Spurs teams uh, lacking in that kind of mentality to get over the finishing line and to actually win a trophy. So in your experience and in your analysis, what do you think this current Spurs team needs to do in terms of its mentality in order to be successful? Thanks. Cheers. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to answer that in terms of what I think mentality is a, a strong mentality a winning mentality is um whether i could lay it to the team these days maybe i can as, as we carry on but um i think a winning mentality is a player that normally through experience 
has seen most things. Being two goals up and lose three, two. Being three goals down, winning four, three. Losing a game in the last minute, winning a game in the last minute. Winning a game with 10 men. Losing against 10 men. You see all aspects of it during your, during your time. Um, I think, me personally, I had a, a professional mentality from a very young age, and that would have been with regard to Bill Nicholson's sort of guidance and the teaching that he gave us. So that doesn't mean to say you're going to win every game, but it does mean to say that you're going to be harder to beat. And, um, you know, you could say that Tottenham over the, the last few years have been incredibly, incredibly exciting to watch. And with forward front players that, that uh, sort of poke you in the eye with their ability and their, their joining up play and their partnerships and their Harry Kane, Son, you know, the special goals and the, and the comebacks. And then you would have some incredibly weak moments. So there appeared to me that there was a soft sort of underbelly there at times. And, um, you know, by winning games does not mean to say that you've necessarily got a winning mentality because, you know, the first three games of last season we won. But no one was really happy other than that we were top of the league all of a sudden, but weren't really convinced how we got those wins. Um, but there was something going right, and, and that was interesting. But, but um, I think that if you've got a winning mentality, you've got a strong mentality about you, you don't get too high or too low with how the game's going. 2 nil up, you then don't start sort of showboating and trying to nutmeg people if that's not your game. So I think that you uh, don't get too high or too low. Don't get too disappointed if you're losing. I like the term. I think it was Bill Nicholson first mentioned it to me. Steve, what's the... What's the the most important minute in any game. And through a bit of naivety or whatever you're thinking, maybe it's the last minute or the first minute because you should start right. And that, that's not wrong because you should start a game right because if you don't start it right, it's hard to get going. And the opponent gets too big an advantage over you by your, by your slow start. Um, but... Yeah, you, you, um, the, the most important minute of any game is the next minute. And that, that does not change whether you're 2-0 up or 2-0 down. You do the right things as per not losing a goal. If an opponent scores one goal against you and you're three up, for instance, now all of a sudden they've got the carrot, they've got the, the impetus to go on and... and Try that bit harder to get the second goal. At 3 0, everyone thinks the game's over, and that's a very dangerous feeling. You on the pitch cannot believe it's over. So you continue to do the right things. Bill Nick was always talking about just do it right, Steve. Just do it right. Whether it's the first minute or the last minute, do it right. So there has to be an ability to go for 90 plus minutes. Um, you, of course, have to start right and, and put your mark on the game. You have to put your mark in a good way on the opponent. Um, I think that Bill Nicholson's way was right with it's 11 v 11. And if you consider yourself 1 v 1 against that particular player, and we win at least six or seven of those individual battles, we should win the game. So, you know, is it about keeping the ball and having 70% possession? Not necessarily, because we've all seen teams that have had 70% and still lose. 
um, one corner kick goes in against you because you're not right, you're not set up right, you're not thinking right. And, um, and all of a sudden that 70% possession goes out the window. So mentality is, is hard to pin down, but it's trying to do things right as many times as you can. And I suppose in, in um, yeah, I suppose in, in, I'm trying to think of another sport where I could talk about that mentality. Um, boxing, boxing, 1v1. If you're going to start off slow, if you are going to start off slow, you're very likely going to get right hand out and it's all going to be finished. So, um, yeah, I, I can't really think of the other sports where this applies, but, but it's obvious, obvious it does. Every, every sport has got its own mindset of doing it right and being on it. And I, I used to speak about you run out of, a, out of the tunnel on a certain day a cold Saturday in November and it just might be because something that's happened at home or a little niggle that you've sort of not quite owned up to you come out in lane three instead of lane six in terms of form and in terms of positivity but it's about not ending up a two or a one it's about ending up keeping that three or even getting to a four on a certain day and then there's other players in the team that can win it for you as long as you don't lose it for the team so you have to you have to be you have to be consistent in what you're trying to do no surprises um if the surprises only only good ones um i suppose in tennis I just thought of something there they talk about unforced errors well, I think a winning mindset, uh, players do less unforced errors. And um, that's, that's my best way of summing it up. Be consistent, be proper, prepare right. Um, believe that your team is, is good enough. Try to put right on a certain day when something's not happening. Um, and, and in the end, you, you, you work and you run for 90 plus minutes. And um, I think that's a, that's a winning mentality. Th there's going to be mistakes in the games. Of course there is. But then you've got teammates who can cover up from, for you the vital moment. And if you think about us defending in the last five games of the season, rather than the middle five games of the season, we wanted to block shots. We wanted to keep the ball out of our net. We wanted to defend. We were more prepared to recover to our goal. And um, that is where the winning mentality came out. And I have to give credit to the Conte man for bringing it out of our players that, uh, that performed so well to get that vital fourth spot. So um, that's trying to turn it into the, the, the current game the current team um yeah i think uh, i think that's that's my answer graham suness had a question about yeah let's listen to his the first question and it was about um the communication when he and both he and me were young players at Spurs. Hi Steve, my question for you is, when we were at Spurs, you obviously got on the first team at a very young age, was there any, I never felt there was any great communication between Eddie Bailey, Bill Nicholson and the players. Am I right in saying that or wrong? Yeah, so, uh, remember this was a different era. This was the late 60s. And I got in the first team at 17. Um, I was a year older than Graham. Graham was an exceptionally talented young player. A lot different than the one he finished up with. And why wouldn't you? I finished up a different type of player as well. 
So he finished up more consistent and more workmanlike uh, than what he'd suggested as a young player. He, he looked a ready-made Spurs player. And so what happened was that he was in a three-man midfield, Mullery one side, Peters the other, and me in the middle, the sort of worker. Um, for Graham to get in the team, he was vying after Mullery's position and Martin Peters. And if you remember, they both played in the 1970 World Cup and therefore they were established players. They were experienced players. And I think what Graham's getting at is the quote that he gave on our, our podcast some months back of saying that if someone had just explained to me, sat me down and explained to me that I need to be patient and your chance will come some of the players in the first team now are getting older and with the older comes more experience, but eventually the sort of legs run out and you're going to be there, Graham, ready to put on that famous white shirt when um, maybe they get injured, not hoping they get injured, but injuries come with players. That's, that's the nature of the game. So suspensions or whatever, the chance is going to come. So what I believe Graham was saying there is that no one did sit him down. No one explained to him the situation. And therefore, Graham, thinking he was making it better, would knock on Bill Nicholson's door most Fridays and ask why he's not in the team. And I suppose... I suppose that's Graham going on the attack. And in that era, that era, you know, no one's, no one's a particular coward or not speaking up when they should. But there was a way to approach the management of the club then, which is surely different to today. In a similar situation today, I think the agent would be asking the question of the chairman. And the chairman would pull the manager into it for some sort of explanation, probably to the agent who then passes it on to the player. I'm not suggesting this is right. I'm suggesting that there was a discipline about how things were done and you did not, you did not attack the management of that era with their experience and their wealth of knowledge and their track record and come out on the good end of it and therefore I think when should the communication have been better yes it should that's looking back at that era did I think it at the time it was probably normal I've said to Graham many times Graham I was playing in the first team when you were in the reserves and they hardly communicated with me other than as the group, as the team that won or lost on the weekend. And now there's a Monday morning meeting. It was very rare that you had a, a, an isolated spell of being in Bill Nicholson's office to talk to him about your game. And if you did, it was po probably to get a bullock in. It was him inviting you in. You weren't inviting yourself into his office to get a bollock in or to be told the way life is. So, yes, I think you're right, Graham. There was not enough communication, but it was the era that we played in and developed in, and you developed into a, a great player. I mean, a great player. And I love listening to Graham um, these days on Sky TV. He's one of the few people that I do listen to. And... Um, all that wealth of knowledge comes from his grounding as a player at Tottenham. And, OK, he learnt other things at Middlesbrough and Liverpool that turned him into the player that he ended up. And he obviously went to Italy. But um, the communication changed from country to country, from era to era. And um, so I think you're right to be aggrieved. We're certainly... We're certainly aggrieved that you didn't stay and 
I think there's another question coming from Graham about what about me, you and Glenn in the midfield? So I don't know what Ozzy would have said about that, but I think that would have pushed me back to right back earlier than I actually did do. But um, yes, that would have been a formidable midfield. And just imagine Sunes Perryman and Hoddle in the midfield playing in the top league in England and all homegrown. Well, that, that would have been worth some money and would have been worth watching and would have been hard to play against, I have to say. So, um, yep, sorry it happened, Graham, and sorry about the lack of communication, but I come back to the same point. It was the era which doesn't make it right, but makes it how life was in those days. Good, Tom. So that's us coming to the end of this podcast. Thank you for listening, everyone. Um, I know there's a, a question or two from uh, Steve, the uh, Leicester Tigers coach, Steve Borthwick. We want to say congratulations to him for winning the, the, the league. Um, once he comes on this podcast, of course, we are following their progress. And I was so delighted. Unfortunately, they beat Saracens in the final. And we know Roy Rayland. He used to work for Spurs and a, a popular character at Spurs. He, I think he's the kit man at uh, Saracens. So, yeah, sorry for him. But, um, but yeah, when you get to those finals, it's not good to lose one, as we all know. But, um, but that's the way. So we'll hear Steve's questions uh, next time. Plus, uh, have, I, have I had your question yet, Tom? Yep, we did it last week. It was obviously a memorable Yeah, one. we did it. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I, I put a question mark here and I wondered why I was. So thank you all for listening and um, keep well. Hope you're enjoying the off-season. Um, tennis just started. Uh, hopefully we have su success there. And, um, you know, that, that winning mentality, I come back to that. And of course, it's against New Zealand and New Zealand are no pushovers, but the cricket, the cricketers look like they've had a change of mentality in the in the five day game in test matches uh, from a previous regime. And it doesn't make that regime wrong, but it, it's a change. So, um, but you know what happens in change? Eventually, your competitors work it out. They work out to beat you. And that's where you have to become adaptable. So uh, let's see if they can do that when the time's right. So thanks for listening. Come on, you Spurs, although we haven't said it for quite a long time. And uh, see you next time. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.